What's up, friends? Welcome back to Whoa, That's Good Wednesday. I hope everybody's having a great week. It's about to get so much better because, friends, we have David Platt on the podcast today with his new book that's about to come out, Don't Hold Back. Let me just read the subtitle because everybody needs to hear this. Leave him behind the American gospel to follow Jesus fully. This is going to be a great conversation. I cannot wait to dive in. Uh, David, thanks for being back on the podcast. It is great to be back, Sadie. I like I'm so thankful for God's grace in you and Christian and uh I just yeah, love every time I'm around you guys. Uh, most recently I guess at Passion and I like this morning was looking back at notes from your talk on Peter and fishing with Jesus oh, awesome. and personal life being your spiritual life. So that's just, awesome. Yeah. Hey, well, so same to, to you. I have to say, I can't wait to talk about passion. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. But your talk at passion inspired me so much. I can't wait to talk about it. But I have to ask you, because today is the day after Valentine's Day, um, hence the pink flowers, the pink shirt. And so we have to at least give the people a little bit of content when it comes to Valentine's Day. You have an awesome marriage. How long have you guys been married? We've been married for 20, going on 24 years. 24 years. And how many kids do y'all have now? We have six kids. So we, uh, I, I say six, so we have five in the home. We just adopted uh, our daughter, Mercy, over the last year. But then one of our kids, uh, we have a son overseas who we're still waiting to pick up. We were supposed to pick him up three days before, wow. well, this is like January, 2020, Three days before uh, we were supposed to leave, COVID kind of shut that process down, and we've been waiting for the last three years. So anyway, wow. uh, he's our six-year-old we're waiting to get, and then we got uh, five others ranging from 16 down to one. Wow, that's incredible. Okay, so obviously we can all look up to a marriage that's lasted 24 years and six kids and all that y'all have done together. So give us a little bit of marriage advice or just relationship advice. There's people listening to this who are single, dating, engaged, married. But if you had to just give us something you've learned over the years of love, what what would you give us? And I know I just mm. sprung that on you. I can see your eyes are like, I did not expect that. But hey, you live you live it. So... Well, I'm like feeling this pressure, like, okay, Heather's going to listen to this. Like, what? And she's going to be like, what, what is the one thing you said? I, I would say, I think we love people well when we learn how to love them well. And I, I mentioned that That's because um, over 24 years, there, ha- like, there are some things that have been consistent in how to love Heather. Um, and there are some things that have changed. And I think I'm constantly, I constantly want to learn how can I best love her now That's in cool. this season and not just in this season, but like in the circumstances we're walking through right now, what does she need most? And I think that applies like generally and just uh, where I was in my Bible reading this morning, Mark 12, love your neighbor as yourself. But mm-hmm. uh, like, what do people need most in our love for them? But specifically and though, yeah, close relationships, mm-hmm. marriage, uh, dating, engaged, like learn, don't ever stop learning each other and learning it's how good. to love each other well. I love that. Learn how to love. I think so many times you just assume that you know, but man, when you take the time to intentionally listen and learn and seek those things, um, it's so true. Um, it makes the world of differences. And there, you know how we all mm-hmm. do like the love language test. And it's so interesting how whenever me and Christian were dating, like what I would say my love language was is actually like Mm. not the same as it is now that Uh. we're, you know, married for three years and have a 20 month old and one on the way. It's Mm. like, it's changed, you know, um, used to probably say acts of service is like at the bottom of the list. I didn't really care that much about acts Uh. of service. And now I'd be like, that is number one. (laughs) Like if you, like he just went and got my, um, car fixed and I was like, that means so much. It makes me feel so loved because I did not want to do that. And so Mm. it's true that to learn to love in the season that you're in really goes so much further than just doing the, you know, ordinary things that anybody can do. But when someone does something because they know your heart, it goes such a long way. Um, So great advice. I know that came out of nowhere. You had it. Well, I I would just add like uh, we we, uh, try to do periodic date nights, uh, regular date nights, but periodically, I do like intentionally even ask that question, like, babe, how can I love you better? Um, and, uh, 
yeah, I, I think it's, well, I'm just so thankful for all the ways, uh, she loves me well and I just want to, yeah, I want to faithfully love her well. So yeah. That's so good. Hope that's helpful. No, that's so helpful. And I think too, now that I'm just thinking about this, it's also cool to let that person in on what you know, just giving clarity for what would help, you know, what, how you could love me better. Cause I think sometimes as women, especially you can be like, Oh, I wish that they would do this or I wish they'd do that. And then you get Mm. disappointed when they don't. And I love that quote when it's like expectation without communication results in frustration. And I'm like, that is so true. And so I try not to ever like put these expectations on Christian that I'm not communicating with him because it's Mm. not fair Mm. to expect him to do something that he doesn't even know. So actually for Valentine's, Valentine's Day this year. I love Valentine's Day. I've always like loved Valentine's Day, but I know like some people don't really care about Valentine's Day. It's like low on the priority list of holidays. It's pretty high for me. I love it. So I was like, I got this email from this flower shop I love about like a Valentine's Day sale. So I like sent it to Christian and I was just like, hint, hint, like I'm basically telling you this is exactly what you should get me for Valentine's Day. And it was just so funny because then a week goes by and um, I I just said, you know, I just want to let you know because I knew he hadn't gotten it. I was like, I just want to let you know I did get you something for Valentine's Day. I was like, you don't (laughs) have to get me something, but I don't want you to be sad whenever I got you something, you didn't get me something. And he goes, oh, well, I I was thinking I would get you something when we go to California. And I said, you totally just thought about that. He goes, yeah, I I totally just thought about that. And it's after Mm -hmm. Valentine's Day that we go to California. But it was just funny because it was a good thing that I said that because then there's like no disappointment, like letting them in Mm -hmm. on kind of how you do want to be loved instead of just making them guess. And so, man, I'm I'm glad you brought that up. We just had that funny situation in our house. Um, But you mentioned passion. I'm I'm glad you're saving Christian too. Like that's that's well well done. I'm saving him. That's super helpful. I'm like, hey, this is exactly the flowers I want. This is not hard. Just buy them. I'll be so happy. Like you might think I would be less happy because I asked you. No, I'll be just as happy. That does (laughs) not changes nothing for me. But no, uh, I got to talk about passion because like you mentioned, it was just so good. And honestly, your message, um, it impacted Christian and I so much. We've talked about it so much and actually so much to the point that, um, you know, you quoted for those who weren't there, uh, Romans 1 through chapter 8, not Romans 1 verses 1 through 8, no, Romans chapter 1 through chapter 8. And it was so inspiring. And uh, since then, I've started to memorize uh, 1 John chapter 1, and um, I'm moving on to chapter 2 now. And I've never memorized like scripture like that. And I'm only at 10 verses in, but still, it's just been such a good challenge and such a good like thing to meditate on the same verse over and over and over again. Um, so when I say you impacted us, we didn't just you know, admire it. We Mm. did admire it. We were in awe of what God did in that room, but we really taken the action to it. And it's just been pivotal for our life. So I want to talk to you about that. One thing that you said when you started the message is you were like, this could get so awkward. This makes me feel uncomfortable. And the reason why you said that is because you were about to ask people to worship to the sound of the word. And so before Mm. we even get to the memorization, Talk to me a little bit about just the concept of the message you preached at Passion and why mm-hmm. you, you felt you were led to go there. Well, I, I love Passion, have for 20 years. Like that's uh, Heather and I actually got engaged right after she got back from a Passion conference. And, no way. Uh, yeah, so she came back from Passion and I asked her to marry me. So anyway, that's been a huge part of our lives and and Passion zeal for the fame of Jesus and our generation and coming generations. I mean, the way it's awesome to see that playing out. I uh, was, as I was praying through where to go with my talk, um, Psalm 138 two kept coming to my mind uh, when, when God says uh, you have exalted above all things, your name and your word. And so just making that connection, that passion for the name of Jesus will mean passion for the word of Jesus. They're both exalted above all things, his mm. name and his word. And so if we're, if we're passionate about Jesus, that will 
lead to passion about his word. And, uh, and so what does that look like in our lives? Is there a zeal, a longing, a passion, a reverence for his word? You know, I, I'll even stick with the Valentine's day theme with a minute for a minute here. Like I remember Heather, when we first started dating, she was the first girl, only girl I ever dated. And, uh, I was so, I was a junior in high school. She was a senior in high school. I was just in awe that I, that girl was talking to me <laughs> and paying attention to me. And I remember, so this was before email, social media, anything like, so she would write me letters. She went off to college. I was still in high school. Uh, she's a year older than me. She would write me letters and I would just soak in like every word. Like she'd write, dear David. And I'd be like, dear <laughs> dear <laughs> and, 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 I get that. and then she put like a a smiley face and then i'd be like oh why a smiley face right there like why <laughs> or awesome. she'd be like i'm praying for you and i it'd be like i wonder how she's praying like she's praying for her just anybody or praying for like her future husband like what is wow. she and so i would like devour and so yeah that's pretty lame that's cool. um, no i, I think did the same because, thing <laughs> but i was obsessed in a way that yes like if if this is the word of god like we should be in and we're and we love god then we would be we should be obsessed with his word like why does it say this here and there and cool. and so what does that passion look like so it's one thing for us to yes sing and send our hands into the air like in worship and in song but what if just the word of god had that effect on our hearts because we loved his word so much and so that was kind of the yeah the premise of what i was praying for in that moment that there would that there would be a uh that the spirit of god would ignite passion for his word in a mm. way that um that would would really mark people Y'all, life has been full lately, which I wouldn't have any other way. You know, we have our 20-month-old, a baby on the way, Christian, we're traveling, we're doing things. And so sometimes, you know what falls short in all of that? My style. I'm like, what am I going to wear? What even fits me at this point? And wouldn't it just be so nice to have a personal stylist? Well, Stitch Fix is like your own personal style partner. It is an incredible thing that I want to tell you about. If you haven't already heard me talk about it on this podcast, all you have to do is take a fun little quiz about where you like to shop, how much you want to spend, and what clothes make you feel your best so that your own personal stylist can help you find the looks that you love. Stitch Fix has thousands of brands and styles, and they even have a wide range of sizes so that you'll find the perfect fit no matter what. One thing that I love about Stitch Fix is there's no pressure to buy anything that you don't want, which is really nice. You're not going to get yourself in a pickle. I get to try on all my pieces at home in my own mirror so I can see what works. I keep what I love, and I send back the rest, so it's just as simple as that. Stitch Fix makes it so easy, y'all, because all shipping returns and exchanges are also always free. Plus, there is no subscription required. So again, there's nothing to fear here. Um, I can get fresh styles delivered to my door whenever I feel like it. Um, if you have an event coming up, Stitch Fix is great for you. It's got you covered. Or if you just want to set it and forget it, they'll send you a fix seasonally or monthly. Uh, they have so many cute options. I recently got two jackets from Stitch Fix that I love. One's like a big, thick puffer jacket that's really cute, and the other one's like a black leather jacket that I can just style with anything up or down. So they have such a wide range of styles. No matter what you're looking for, I'm sure they have the perfect thing for you. Right now, Stitch Fix is offering my listeners $20 off their first fix at stitchfix.com slash woe. That's stitchfix.com slash woe for $20 off today. Go to stitchfix.com um, slash whoa. Well, it was really cool because when you set, like you, you laid out the foundation of the worship for the word idea and why we need to hold his word at such a level and, and how they used to. And you read Nehemiah and it was just such mm -hmm. a beautiful picture of when they opened the word and they would just start weeping. And then you kind of said, you know, so I just want to see what will happen as we just read the word. And and you said, for a number of reasons, this makes me feel uncomfortable, and I have no idea how this is going to go. And I remember thinking, this could get uncomfortable. I remember thinking, this is going to be interesting. And my thought as to what might happen, I'm, I'm such a... Um, I'm kind of a worst case scenario person, so this is totally, this is totally me. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I bet the super charismatic people 
are going to get super extra in this moment. And the super conservative people are, are going to feel super <laughs> awkward in this moment. <laughs> and we're just going to see how this plays out. But that's not what happened. Um, it really was like the spirit of God ignited a passion in the room for the word. And it was not, it was not about um, nobody was seeking attention from their worship. Mm -hmm. It was genuine mm -hmm. worship for the word mm -hmm. as if you would worship to a worship song. That was the mm -hmm. response that was happening as you quoted the word. And I didn't expect myself to react the way that I did. I was on my knees. I could not stop crying. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I know Romans one through eight, not like you mm -hmm. do, but I've read it. I've heard it. I've heard it preached. I had never um, seen it in such an awe and wonder and a love mm. letter like I did that day, um, like it was intended to be spoken, like it was intended to mm. be preached. And it was the That's coolest funny. thing ever. It, it, your prayer was exactly what was felt in the room. Mm. It was mm. funny, though, because you said we're going to read Romans 1 through 8. So I pull up my Bible, um, starting at Romans 1, and I'm like, he is going so fast. And I look at Christian, and I said, he's going so fast. And Christian said, he's not reading it. He's quoting it. I I said, what? I looked up. I didn't even know. And then I was like, this is crazy. And then you just kept going. When was it in your life that you took the time to learn Romans 1 through 8? And was it something that you mm -hmm. sought out to do? Or is it something that just kind of became from reading it as much as you did? Mm, no, I would say intentional, like seeking to memorize scripture because of, uh, I mean, I, you always ask like, what advice have you been given? Like that's one of the biggest, most important pieces of counsel I've ever received in my life is I, there was a guy who did something similar when I was in high school, actually. Um, he was leading musical worship. It's like a small setting, uh, 100, 200 people. And he, uh, he puts down the guitar He's like, I just want to encourage you guys with the word. And he quoted a chapter of scripture, maybe Philippians 2. I can't remember exactly what chapter it was, but um, I just remember th sitting there like, whoa, this word, the word is just flowing from this guy. And uh, uh, one of the guys who've had a, who's had a huge influence in my life was there, um, kind of a mentor for me. And he just said, David, he, he could tell it affected me. He said, David, if you if you want to know God and his power in your life and be an instrument in his hands, like hide his word in your heart like that and really challenge me. And so, um, yeah, after that I, uh, started, okay, what would this look like? So I started memorizing the first, uh, book I memorized was second Timothy and, uh, just memorized this, this book about, and it changed my relationship with God and my spiritual life in so many ways, in ways that uh, I think only happen when we, when well, in, in ways that deepen when you, you do that kind of memorization, because the word it does, it becomes a part of you. It transforms your mind and your heart as it's soaking in like that, where it's, it's literally becoming second nature. I mean, if you were to yeah, just first John one, it can just flow from you or Romans eight or whatever. Like it's just, it changes your prayer life because you, you, I mean, we're supposed to pray according to the word. And so it, it fuels how we pray. Uh, this is where even memorizing like Psalms, different Psalms is really helpful because just to be able to overflow and praise with the very inspired That's words cool. that God has given for his praise. And then with encouraging others in Christ uh, or sharing the gospel to have the word hidden in your heart in ways that just flow. Like I think about our uh, uh, church group is what we call them here in our church in Metro DC. We were meeting last night and uh, we were actually, there were just different parts of Romans that were coming up that I was sharing to edify our group. Uh, so to have that hidden in your heart. Um, so in your personal time with the Lord and your effect in others' lives, um, like th to have the word flow from you. And I know different people have different capacities to memorize. Um, and so I always want to be sensitive to that at the same time. Well, illustration I sometimes use, like, um, if I were to give you a thousand dollars for every verse you could memorize between now and this time tomorrow, could you 
maybe learn to memorize some. I, th- I think you probably would. Like yeah. anybody would. Uh, I mean, Jesus wept like John eleven thirty five. There we go. A thousand dollars. I mean, so you do. It. And so I guess that's the question. Psalm 119 talks about how his word is better than thousands of gold and silver pieces. So I guess that's the question. Like, is it worth it that much to us to really know God's word like this? Um, so uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's part of why, uh, Amidst the uncomfortableness of that kind of moment, I wanted to lean into it because Mm -hmm. I just, I look around that arena and I think, oh, if there was a feasting on the word and a valuing of the word and it's all these uh, hearts and lives in this arena, it would be life changing and uh, not just for the people in this room, but for people Mm -hmm. that are impacted by them. It's true. It was really cool how there would be moments throughout you quoting that other people knew, you know, like the majority of the room knew a couple of those verses Mm -hmm. in Romans that they would quote back with you. And, uh, you know, we are more than conquerors and Christ. He's like, everybody shouts that out. And then my favorite part was when we started going, um, nothing can separate you from God's great love. Can sword. It was like, no, can famine. No. And it just was like so cool because that's what I mean. It was like one of the first times that you really realized the gravity of what the word was saying, you know, I think for a lot Mm. of people, because for, you know, someone just sitting in the room reading, maybe they're skimming through, maybe they're reading fast. um, You don't really stop to think about what that really means. And so to hear Mm. it preached over you while you're agreeing with it is like, whoa, like that's what God says. Like that's Mm. what Paul was preaching. Like that is crazy. And I think that's, what's been cool about slowing down and reading the scripture for me because I've like struggled with, um, well, (laughs) this is funny that you said that about capacity. So I was thinking like, I'm just not going to be good at that. You know, I'm just not good at scripture memorization. Like all through school, went to a Christian school. We had to like memorize a verse every week and I was terrible at it. I was like, this is like, so not my thing, but I really didn't pay that much attention to it. Right. I wasn't intentional with it. And um, also, I have struggled in the past with dyslexia. And I was like, you know, just gave all the excuses as to why, like, that wasn't probably the thing for me. Um, I've also excused mm-hmm. myself with just um, part of just my personality is like some people will watch the same movie like over and over and over again. I'm like, no, I've seen it. I'm done. I read a book. Mm-hmm. I read it. I loved it. It could be my favorite book ever. I probably won't ever read it again, you know? And so with the Bible, sometimes I have this tendency to be like, oh, well, I know Romans or whatever. I've, I've read mm-hmm. it, you know, but not like going back and studying and mm-hmm. meditating on it. And I love that Psalms 1, 2, and 3 where it's like for those who meditate on the word it will nice. be like a tree planted by a stream of living water. So I think what it's awakened in me is like forget the excuses. Like I want to mm-hmm. meditate on the word. And for me to see like what meditation has already done in the first month of the year, it's been amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew I needed to get out some distractions. Like I deleted social media. I deleted the news from my like – you know, when you swipe mm. left and it's the news, it's the Bible now. And um, just those mm. two things, like meditating on the word and getting rid of distractions, it's so crazy. Um, people around me have been like, you have this new joy about you. Like, what in the mm. world? Like, you seem so at ease. You seem so at peace. And nothing, like, has changed that much in my life besides I've been meditating on the word. <laughs> and then I got rid mm. of distractions. And that has been, like, the coolest thing. And I notice a difference. Like, when people tell me that, I'm like, isn't it crazy? It's, like, literally what's coming out of me from getting rid of distractions and meditating on the word. And so um, mm. I'm just, like taken what he preached and really seen the the beauty of living by it the past month and I haven't done it perfectly. I thought I would be uh, moving at a faster pace. I'm kind of uh, moving at a slow pace, but still what it's doing in me is it's just watering the soul. It's been awesome. When it comes to Valentine's Day, you know I'm all about the candy. I love me some candy, y'all. I mean, who doesn't like candy? If somebody doesn't like candy, you should question the character of the person. I'm just kidding. Actually, they're probably really a great person and really good at discipline. I love candy, though. I love chocolate. I love sour. I love sweet. I do not discriminate against my candy. And that is why I love Native's new limited edition, 
candy shop collection. Like all native products, these are thoughtfully formulated to keep you feeling good and smelling good all day. And I'm sure you already know about the native brand from their aluminum free deodorant, but one thing I really love is that their products are all made from ingredients that you know and understand, like coconut oil, shea butter, and baking soda. So you're not looking at the back and being like, what is this? Uh, I typically stay pretty active with tennis, random dancing of course with my boo or getting back from the gym but native deodorant checks all of the boxes for me because you know not every deodorant that's free of all the stuff actually last but this deodorant is great it has a 72 hour odor protection naturally derived ingredients and a smooth residue free application and let's face it no one wants deodorant showing up on their clothes am i right and we've all been there so native has got you covered on that native also has so many long lasting scents from woodsy to sweet to clean and fresh and y'all with new and limited edition scents being released all the time there's something to keep everyone smelling amazing all day long and just make it fun. One thing that I really love right now is that they have all their Valentine's Day scents like strawberry and vanilla taffy scent from their candy shop collection as well as scents like gummy bears, sour berry belt, and sweet cinnamon hearts. Uh, I chose the strawberry vanilla taffy because I love Laffy Taffy. I love the strawberry one so I was like hey if I like the candy why not try the deodorant and it just makes it so fun like I said to just get to experiment with different smells for your deodorant because it's kind of one of those things that's just kind of a blah moment in life putting on your deodorant so why not make it fun now it's the perfect time to make the switch from an antiperspirant to native so that you can keep staying active and smelling fresh all day when you visit their site you can check out all of their fresh scents and maybe even try out one of their body washes while you're at it which I really love their body washes as well right now go to nativedeo.com slash woe or use the promo code woe at checkout to get a sweet 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash woe or use the promo code woe at checkout for 20% off your first order. I love that, Sadie. That's so, oh, it's just so encouraging on so many different levels. And, and, and really, as I'm sitting here listening to you share just like if the effect of that in your own heart, your own life, what's in you, flowing from you. I just think like this should be the norm for us as followers of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Like that, uh, but we, if we're not careful, yeah, we get on, we like can scroll mm -hmm. through so much and there's so much distraction. I mean, we live in a world of distraction, but I mean, it's one of the things I talk about in that in the book is uh, like uh, Muslims who memorize the whole Quran like the whole thing and um and not just memorize it they memorize it in arabic when they that may not even be their primary language like there's a a commitment to the word that wow should be there and if we believe this is the word of god like what a treasure a treasure that's so valuable more valuable than anything else in the world so yes and it brings life. It's daily bread. Yeah. It, uh, your word is life. Mm -hmm. So we're, when you think about it, it's, it's just foolishness for us not to, yeah. for that not to be commonplace among us and for us not to be saying, okay, how can we do this together and uh, spur one another on toward Jesus by, by meditating, memorizing his word? It's good. I love that. Gosh, I want to ask you because I talked about some of the excuses that I've had in my life and I've had several mm. others, I'm sure, when it comes to not reading my word as much. You can throw out how busy you are and this and scheduling and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm sure like in your life, there's been times where maybe before uh, you are who you are today that maybe you had distractions or um, busyness keep you from that or whatever it was. But do you think and maybe... I'll let you speak to that a little bit, but also I want to ask you, do you think because of you traveling to places that people didn't have the word and um, just kind of the radical lifestyle that hmm. you've been able to see across the world, do you think that's what's giving you the perspective of the value of the word? Um, and what would you say to people just to paint a perspective who are like, you know, I'm just too busy to read the word? Uh, because I think we could all like just say, we could all say that and you could maybe believe that, but I just think that that's not necessarily true no matter how busy we are. Mm. Um, and I'm saying that from someone who said that as an excuse and then had to get honest with myself about what the real problem was. And so can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, I would, I would definitely confess um, 
there have been times in my life I would even add like uh, times in my life as a pastor where I've I've not been meditating on God's word. And I I should say, like I'm I think of a long season in my life where I was uh um I mean the church I pastor was growing. Uh I was getting invited to preach in a lot of different places. I was really busy doing a lot of and, and I would do a lot of ministry things and church things and uh and even preparing. So I'd I'd study the word to prepare a sermon, but I wouldn't study the word just to know God and uh just to hear from him in my own life and so i i've i've been there and that's that's i always just think how frightening that is how busy i could be doing a lot of good things but missing the most important thing doing it all apart from intimacy with god in prayer and the word um and but then yes when i when i go i mean i I will never forget the first time I was with underground house churches in East Asia. And, uh, like we, we, I, we, I was, we were going to a Bible study, uh, or they had asked me to come. I mean, they, they're gathering together in secret. They found out that I, uh, uh, t- was teaching. I had just started teaching in a seminary actually at that point. And, uh, and so they, they found out I was in town. They were like, Hey, will you meet with our house church leaders? in the secret location. So I said, sure. I went, I was expecting to do like an hour Bible study and eight hours later we were still going strong and they're just, they're just soaking it in. And, uh, they say, can we do this again tomorrow? And I'm like, well, sure. Like what time they were like in the morning. I was like, okay, morning Bible study. And they said, no morning to the evening. <laughs> and so that led to, I was in, in country for about two weeks. It was two weeks, eight to 12 hours a day. Wow. Just diving into the word. And so hungry, Sadie. They just, I mean, wow. And and hungry just to know the Bible. I remember the one of the early on in that time, I was walking through Nehemiah, actually showing the background history of the book, um, and showing the importance of God's word. And uh, so as I gave them all that background history, they were like, "We've never heard this stuff before. Can you do that for us with all the books of the Old Testament?" And I was like. Well, that would take a lot of time. They were like, we want to do this. Wow. And so that's what we did. Like for a week and a half, we walked from Genesis to Malachi. And I just gave them background and history and understanding. the book. And and they were just eating it up. Wow. We, I remember we, we finished. We had one day left. And we got there early in the morning. They were like, we want to go 12 hours. It's like, okay. And uh, I start teaching something. I can't remember what. I was like, I mean, we've cover, covered Habakkuk. <laughs> like what else is there oh to cover? Oh, my gosh. And, uh, in the back, I start teaching something. This guy kind of said, Hey, we, we have a problem. I said, What's what's the problem? And all this is your translator. And he he said, You've taught us the whole old testament, but you've not given us the new testament. And I was like, Well, we've only got a day. He's like, Will you please give us the new testament today? And so that's what we did for the next oh eleven hours. Oh my gosh. We walked from Matthew to Revelation. Like they love the word. <laughs> it, they love it's awesome. uh, and they're risking their lives to wow. know it. Wow. Uh, I mean, just imagine go into a worship, not, not all day, like training in the word with their leaders, just a worship service late at night. I remember the, we, it was like, I don't know, one, two o'clock in the morning. We get, I get in the back of this car with a hood over my head and we drive out in this village and I get out with my head down and uh, follow these believers like by a little flashlight into this house in this village. It's that one little light bulb hanging in the middle and all these believers crammed in quietly and they're like please like teach us the word for a couple hours and so it was it wasn't like all right we want a 30 minute sermon in and out like they're just hmm. they, they gathered at the risk of their lives and wow. because they're zealous for the word and so i look at that and then think of my own life and the church culture i'm a part of and i i long to 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 want the word like that to treasure the word like that and to be a part of a community that wants and treasures wow. the word like that. That's so. so powerful. Gosh, I love that so much. Um, I want to talk about your book because if you guys saw our last podcast, David wrote a book called Radical. It's one of my favorite books. I recommend that to everybody. And now he has a new book out and uh, he's an incredible author and you just have so much wisdom. That's evident to everyone who's listening. And I want to talk about, because you talk a lot about the American gospel and uh, the danger of that, believing that. So can you mm-hmm. break down what 
is the American gospel versus the gospel of Jesus and why you feel mm. like it's become such a dangerous route that we've gone down? Yeah, I, so basically to summarize, uh, and this is especially after pastoring in Metro DC, like the last few years, yeah, wrote radical years ago, taking back your faith from the American dream was kind of the subtitle on that one. I'm convinced after the last few years here in Metro DC and a lot of, a lot of things that have happened in the church and our country that it's never been just an American dream that's consumed our lives that it's actually an American gospel that's hijacked our hearts. And wow. what I mean by that is that we've exchanged a biblical gospel that exalts Jesus above everything in the world for an American gospel that prostitutes Jesus for the sake of comfort and power and politics and prosperity in our country. And, hmm. uh, and I think the evidence of that has has been a lot of division in the church, a lot of discouragement or even disillusionment among Christians, uh, and even many, especially in the next generation, like disengaging from the church altogether, like looking around and seeing some of the division and some of the, yeah, the discouragement of the church and thinking, I thought there was more to Jesus than this. I thought there was more to the church than this. And that's, so I wrote this book to say, there is so much more to Jesus and so much more to the church than what we've seen around us in recent days. And we can experience it, not, not it, we can experience him. We can experience the awe-filled wonder of Jesus and an otherworldly beauty of the church that's unlike any other community in the world. We don't need to disengage from it. We want to we want to see it and be a part of it in all of its splendor. Yeah. But in order to do so, I think we need to talk about some issues and some things need to be different and not in those other people, uh, but in, in us. That's so good. that's, that's kind of the <laughs> impetus for the book. Y'all, the Huff fam is growing, as many of you know. Baby girl number two is on the way, and the time is just flying by. So I'm trying to get as much rest as I possibly can with my Helix Sleep Mattress, especially in this season. Right now, we have been trying to potty train, honey. Everything's just crazy, you know, whenever you're trying to potty train. Plus, she just got a little sickness that she's getting over, so sleep is um, not, you know, coming by very often. But when we sleep, even though it's limited, we want it to be great great and it's so important and that's why we upgraded to Helix because no matter how much sleep we're getting, at least we're getting great sleep. Christian and I took the Helix sleep quiz and we were matched with the Helix Midnight Mattress because we wanted something that felt not too firm and not too soft and we were both side sleepers, which uh, that's actually cool that they even care to know about that. But not only is the mattress the best one that we've ever sl slept on, but the setup was super fast and easy, which is just as much of a win to me because I'm all about the convenience right now. Helix mattresses are delivered in a box straight to your door for free. So check that out. That's pretty big. And if you've been searching for the perfect mattress, their lineup includes 14 unique mattresses. And they even have a collection of luxury models, a mattress for tall and big sleepers, and a mattress just for kids. So one day, honey's going to have her own too. Or maybe she might be sharing with her sister. We'll see. Helix has models with memory foam layers, models with more responsive foam to cradle your body, which actually, yeah, you kind of does feel like when you lay in, it like hugs you, and enhanced cooling features to keep you from overnight heat, which here's the thing, Christian gets so hot at night, so he is a huge fan of this element to Helix Sleep. Every Helix mattress combines wrapped steel coils in the base and foam layers at the top to give you the perfect combination of comfort and support, and it really does do just that. But don't just take my word for it, Helix Sleep was awarded the number one mattress pick by Wire Magazine, and even Cabo loves it. Our dog is a big fan, uh, so sometimes to a fault, I'm like, Cabo, please move, give me my space. But y'all, also there is even a 10 or 15 year warranty depending on the model that you get. So if you're nervous about buying a mattress online, don't worry, they got you. You can actually try it out for 100 nights risk free. And if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for you and give you a full refund. So you don't have to be nervous at all. But I know that you're gonna love it because once again, it's gonna give you the best sleep of your life. Helix is offering up to $350 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Just go to helixsleep.com Sadie. This is their best offer yet. And 
It's not going to last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. So go to helixsleep.com slash Sadie and check it out today. I love that. I love that when you talk about just the individual and our responsibility. And I do want to talk about just, you know, for the individual, for people listening who are like, maybe they're fed up with a church. Maybe they're discouraged by the way that the church is going. And they're like, what can I do? Um, What can I do to play a part in bettering the Big C Church? I'm, I'm thinking about a friend of mine who works at a coffee shop right now. And she's so frustrated by the management of the coffee shop, right? And she's like, this is so frustrating and this is just not going well and I can't, I don't know what I can do. And so what she wants to do is she wants to quit, right? Because she's like, I don't want to be a part of this because I don't know how to help it because I'm just an employee. How can I do anything that that matters, right? Well, I think in the same way, a lot of people feel that with the church. It's like, this is so mm-hmm. frustrating because of the way that the church is going and I don't want to be a part of this. This is what it's going to look like if I don't have an opportunity to help change. And so for the individual listening who's like, I love Jesus. I don't like where the church is going. How do I help be a part of furthering um, the unity and the goodness of the Big C Church? Mm, Love that question. And I love even the kind of analogy with the uh, friend of yours in the coffee shop. And because as you're you're sharing that, I'm thinking, oh, that's, that's good. And it's a helpful reminder, especially to so anybody who's a follower of Jesus, you're uh, just to be a, a reminded, you're not just you're not an employee in a shop. Like you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You are a vital part of the church. Yeah. And so this is this is who you you've been welcomed into. I mean, this is to follow Jesus is to be a part of a community mm-hmm. of brother, a family of brothers and sisters in Christ. And you are a critical part of that. Uh, Like every, this is 1 Corinthians 12, every member of the body matters. Uh, You know, from the toe to the eye, like it all. And so we all have significance in that. So just to, I I think we need to start by not seeing ourselves as like, well, I'm just kind of over here. Like, no, no, you, you are in the family of God. Like you're, and you're filled with the spirit of God and you have gifts for the building up of the body. Okay. So then, so what do I do? How can I do that? And that's where start to look at where, where do I have relationships? Where do I have opportunities to cultivate? And one of the things I talk about in the book is cultivating community on earth. Like it is in heaven. Mm, that's Meaning good. how can I, how can I, well, one in, in a culture where everybody's quick to cancel and belittle and criticize and whatever, I, God's called us to live totally distinct from mm-hmm. that, to, to, to be humble in our relationships with others, to be uh, eager to maintain unity, to bear with, be patient with. I and mean, one of the things we try to do in uh, just on a kind of grassroots level in our church family is, is to say, and as we think about cultivating community on earth as it is in heaven, like be around brothers and sisters in Christ who are, who come from some different perspectives than you. That could be That's generationally. Good. Like we have so much to learn from each other generationally. Like, yes, there's value in sharing a life alongside others who are in the same age and stage of life. So yes, there's value in that, but there's also a lot of value in across generations, across ethnicities. That's one of the things I dive into the book that, I mean, for it's, it's, it's crazy ever since slavery, like we have divided as the church, according to the color of our skin. And that, why are we still doing that? Like we should not, it's, it's way past time to turn the tide on, on that. Yeah. And so how do we across ethnicities, across even different perspectives, people who don't think exactly like, like we're so yeah. prone to isolate ourselves in kind of echo chambers where everybody's thinking and talking exactly like us, like, um, to really cultivate community across because that's the beauty. When I think about, so this is just the, the church I pastor where there's a hundred different nations represented over a hundred in the church. That's like, cool. uh, so all kinds of different people from all kinds of different backgrounds and a lot of different perspectives. And there's no other explanation why, for why these people, not just are sitting next to each other on a Sunday, but they're sharing life with each other. The only explanation for that is the cross and resurrection hmm. of Jesus cool. and the spirit of God. That's the only explanation. Otherwise this would make no sense. And <laughs> 
let's let's pursue that kind of community yeah. and uh and so to the extent with which we can where we live to pursue that and to take initiative to do that it's worth it it's and good. not to that's what i love about your question Sadie, because it's we can't sit back and say well it's not happening here it's not happening that way so i'm just not gonna engage like yeah. no this is who we are as followers of jesus we're part of a family we don't not engage with the family so how can we engage in those kind of ways that are that are healthy for us healthy for others and will show the beauty of the body of christ it's great gosh i love that so much it makes me think about um i recently had a conversation that was an interesting conversation amongst a lot of believers but something got brought up where there's different kind of the theological points of views in the room right and then then the verse gets brought up, well, whatever we do, we're supposed to make peace with one another, right? But then this version, this person's version of making peace was everybody needs to agree with this person. And it's like, well, mm. that, how, is that, how does that make sense? Because then that would mean that you're just saying that they have to admit that they're wrong, but this is not right mm. or wrong. This is just two different, really, perspectives. It's not changing a salvation issue. It's just two different mm. perspectives and theology and what you perceive and whatnot. And then it was like, this, okay, well, the Holy Spirit, if He, you know, uh, speaks to all of us, then, then why is this confusing? Why is why are they thinking this? Why are they thinking this? And I think when you get in these situations, it's hard because then people get in camps. It's like, oh, well, they're mm. this and they're this and they think that and they think this. And so we can't all come together. And I love about Passion Conference, speaking of passion, is like, Lou and Shelley mm. have people speak who, you know, we all love each other. But if we really all sat and like talked about everything that we think about God, there'd probably be a mm. few different, you know, points of views or a few different expressions of worship or a few different things like that. I mean, the main thing's the main thing. And that's why we all come together, mm. and love each other. But there might be a, a couple of different points of views. For the people who think you think different than me, we're in different camps. Um, just speak to, I, I think, the danger of just the disunity that that speaks to in the church mm. and how, as a church, can we say we might have a couple of different perspectives, but that doesn't mean that we need to isolate. Like, how do we begin to come together even when there might be certain things that are a little bit different? Does that make sense? Because I, I feel like yes. in the young people especially, what I've seen a lot in young people, especially Christian young people who maybe have gone to Christian schools, Christian colleges, it's like the legalism and the mm. grouping of camps is so prevalent and it is such a turnoff to me. And I'm sure it is such a turnoff to people, who, especially who aren't Christians. I love God and that annoys me, you know? And so mm. Um, mm. I think when people look at the church as so disunified, it is hard, but how do we begin to bring unity to those things? Um, and unity may be coming from not necessarily agreeing, but how does unity still take place when you disagree yes this is this is so significant I mean, this is actually this is why this is like the first chapter in the book i wrote because so here's what i would i would offer like practically to help maybe think through i, I talk about like three different buckets to put our beliefs in so first bucket would be the things that unite all of us as followers of jesus i mean this is the gospel um who jesus is who god is how he saves us from our sin and ourselves and then God's word, the authority of God's word. Like these are, that's, that's it's what good. makes us followers of Jesus. Then second bucket would be things that uh, unite us in a local church, which would be different than the first bucket. I mean, we, we still share a first bucket, but then this is where, yeah, other followers of Jesus who believe the gospel may have different views on baptism or how the church is structured or governed, or I don't expect everybody in the church I pastor, everybody in Metro Washington D.C. to come to the church I pastor in Metro Washington D.C. We where we do things a certain way according to certain convictions. I love brothers and sisters in Christ who do things very differently. What you mentioned with passion, yes, there are some of these things in the second bucket where. I know different speakers of passion would, would disagree on, but we are totally together on the first bucket. Mm -hmm. And then That's the good. third bucket would be things within a local church that you agree to disagree about. Yeah. And so what's really important is to keep those buckets separate. That's and good. Uh, so I think like I mean, one example from the last couple of years, uh, when I've heard people say like, well, you can't be a, and this is kind of the American gospel picture. You can't be a follower of Jesus. You can't be a Christian and vote for 
And I heard different people names come after that. And it's like, okay, wait a second. We just put, you can't be a Christian. We just put who you vote for in a presidential election in the same bucket as we put wow. the cross of Jesus and the triune nature of God. Like, yeah. no, that's nowhere close. Yeah. And it's not, it's not important, but it's not primary in this way. And Scared. so to have an understanding that we're going to have differences in these, buckets, and then to be able to love people who have different thoughts and different buckets, like to love other believers in a local church who have disagreements about all kinds of things, to love other people across local churches that have differences and to love all kinds of followers of Jesus with all kinds of different convictions that are yeah. holding fast to the gospel and holding fast to God's word. And, and that's where I think the love for each other, when we disagree on those things, that's where we, I think we have a lot of muscles we need to develop more yeah. in the church along those lines, because we don't, do that well. Yeah. Um, and, and there's, I would just add, there is beauty to be found when we do that well. I think about conversations in our church where people passionately disagree about. I mean, we've talked about issues of justice and race and where people have some very different perspectives and disagreements. And, but we're not afraid to have those conversations because those things, where we land on those things are not what unites us. Jesus, the gospel, the authority of God's word is what unites us together. It's so scary. we're not, some people say, well, why have those conversations? They're just going to divide us. Well, they won't divide us if they're not what unites us. What That's unites good. us is Jesus and the gospel and God's word. And then we're free to share different convictions on these things, hold different That's convictions great. on like third bucket issues and learn from each other, listen to each other humbly, uh, be open to maybe changing our minds, maybe not. In the end, holding fast to the gospel together as a family. Yeah. I think that brings great glory to our Father. And I think it shows yes. the world around us that there's something distinct going on here. Gosh, that's so good. I love how you talked about if it's not what unites us, it shouldn't be like what divides us. And so mm -hmm. I think that's really cool because I can think of a specific topic that I used to question um, just it, again, not first bucket issue, but it was just one of those things where I was like, I don't really understand this. And everybody would ask this question to you that was like turned off to the idea of talking about it because they're like, oh, no, 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 don't talk about that because um, mm. that tends to, whenever people talk about that, disunify. I guess it makes people mad, makes people frustrated or whatever. And I was like, no, I really am not here to argue a point. I'm not here to say this is my, I just want to understand what that looks like, what this means to you. And it was really frustrating because I couldn't get a genuine answer from somebody because they were so afraid to engage in this conversation. I don't know if it was from their own defense of it or not knowing enough about it or from what they experienced someone else's reaction to them sharing this uh, part of their faith. And so um, I was like, you know, that's really sad that we can't have this conversation. Well, eventually... Um, I got into the conversation with some of my really close friends and we had a couple hours worth of conversation and it was so helpful. And at the mm. end of it, we uh, didn't necessarily fully agree, but it didn't matter. It didn't um, bring us away from each other. It actually brought us closer to each other. It, at the end of the day, we both said, or all of us that were there, there's about four of us, we all said, you know what, this makes me love God more. Um, and what was cool about that is we all felt more loved by God. We all love God more and we all felt differently about why, why we felt that way. And it just was a really cool conversation. I said, this is the beauty of having yes. some of those hard conversations, but you're right. It does. I think it does have to be in the right place. You know, it, for mm. me, it, I ended up getting the conversation I was desiring to have with some of my best friends. It, when it was kind of on a whim, we were on a car ride. We had like a seven hour drive we were listening to a sermon which led us into the conversation and mm. um it was just awesome and so i i love that and i think um man you talk so much about in the book about inviting you know different people and i love this quote i think this is so good and i wanted to read it it says what might happen if we spent less time posting commenting and tweeting about one another and more time actually being with one another what might happen if we had the courage to leave our echo chambers and listen to people who believe differently than us and i just love that call to uh, i guess the courage it takes sometimes mm -hmm. to engage in hard conversations and to listen to love to show up and um, I know we keep going back to passion, but I think it shows a lot of 
a good example of Louis and Shelley inviting mm. all those speakers to come, knowing that they probably also have different views than the mm. speakers that they mm. know are coming. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot. I mean, as a leader, uh, I'm leading a ministry now. I know and whenever I ask speakers to come, you know, it's like you think really hard because you're like, this is representing uh, something that I'm yes. putting out there. And so you have to kind of let go of wanting to control everything and just letting the church be the church, letting uh, mm. the church be human, but the bride of Christ and how beautiful that is that we all come together as the body and like, you just have to just let God be God and us be his people. And um, I think, you know, for those listening who don't run a ministry or have a conference in the same way, who do you invite to your dinner table? Who do you invite to mm. your home? Who are you calling? Who are you having a conversation with? In the same way, you can invite people into your home that might not, you know, uh, think exactly the same, but what great, what a great place to gather around a meal and further yeah. in your love for God. And um, man, that's what I've experienced in such cool ways with my own friends. And so, David, this has just been so fruitful. Uh, I want you to add to that if you want to. Well, I would just say, I would just put exclamation point in that on a, on a couple different levels. One, I, I the way you talked about how that was so good for you and your friends as you dove into that, I think that's, yeah, it's it's what God desires as our Father. I think he's really pleased to see his sons and daughters. I don't know if it was all just girlfriend, like daughters, like uh, talking together around his word. Like I love the picture just of, okay, his word is the foundation. We love your word with that, which is clear in your word. We're holding, holding fast to, and as we try to apply it in the world and we come to some different conclusions and this way, that like, I think the father, our father is pleased in seeing his family do that in a loving, caring, listening, humble way. And, uh, and then I would just add, even with uh, people outside the church who don't agree on first bucket issues, who would not believe the gospel, who wouldn't believe the authority of God's word, who have very different views on all kinds of things in the world uh, that we would even hold, hold to as first bucket issues as followers of Jesus. But, still to have the ability to sit around the table with and listen to and understand as best as possible and be able to to listen humbly and then offer a different perspective that comes from God's word with honor and with compassion. I just think about uh, a variety of different groups in our culture today that would look at the church and be like, the church hates us hmm. or the church yeah. and that do not feel honored yeah. by the church. When we've got a clear command, first Peter, to honor everyone, yes. that everyone should feel honor flowing from us toward them. And uh, that's one of the things to talk about, like, how do we share God's word? Um, like it's water for our friends in a spiritual desert instead of like it's a weapon yes. uh, that we're wielding in a cultural war. Like, no, yeah. like, we, yeah, we're at battle, but the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, that's our battle. Not with people. Not with we people. love people. We honor people. We come, we should. And so to be able to even have those kind of conversations uh, with with people who are not followers of Jesus in order to show the beauty of God's word to them in the way we approach them, I think is that that is a whole nother level at which this is so needed today. Gosh, that's so good. I know we're, we're going low, but I have to say this because this, what you just said was exactly what bothered me is that the, the conversation, the topic I kept bringing up to people, what, Every one of those people said to me, as numerous people, is they said, you know, gosh, is going to have to reveal that to you. Like, God revealed it to me. Gosh, mm -hmm. is going to have to reveal that to you. And like, we, I'm not going to talk about it. Like, let God reveal that to you. But it made me mm -hmm. so frustrated because then I was like, well, why has God not revealed it to me? Like, mm -hmm. why did God reveal it to all of you, but he didn't reveal mm -hmm. it to me? And then it made me feel like, I was left out as something that God had for his people. Mm -hmm. And I was like questioning, well, why God? Like, if this is so good and you've told all these people and they won't share it with me and I have to wait for you, like I've mm -hmm. asked you, like, and you're not, this is not being revealed. And um, that was really frustrating because it made me feel like, left out of a good thing. And I just don't mm. feel like God leaves his people out of a good thing. You know, I feel like everyone's invited to the same cross, the same table. And so that was just really frustrating to me. And I feel like sometimes, you know, people 
uh, as Christians, like you have that mentality of like, God will reveal it to him. It's like, no, like God mm. called you to go and make disciples, like you to go and preach the word, baptizing people. And also like, I love that. What's the story in the New Testament when he's like, how would I know? No one's, unless someone's told me, like mm-hmm. you, like you have to read it to me, you know? And so I just think it's so good. We're talking about this because as mm. believers, like we are called to share the word, to honor people, um, to help explain these things. That's why you sat with those people day after day for 12 hours Mm. and went through Mm. every single book, not just expecting like, oh, well, I can leave and God can reveal it. Yes, God can. Yes, God can do that. Mm. He can bring it in a dream. He can speak it to the person. He can do it. But also like if you're there, then I think God's using you in that moment. You have an opportunity. Mm. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I'm glad I was able to share. I have one real quick thing there. I know we're out of time. I love it. I love it. I I just got to hit on that one. Like I was, because I was just in Mark 9, 42 through 50 uh, uh, this last week. And uh, that's when Jesus is, he's talking about hell uh, as an unquenchable fire where the worm never dies and the fire's never quenched. I mean, it's such a heavy passage about uh, eternal judgment. And, uh, but at the very end, uh, it said, Jesus says, he starts talking about being salt in the world and being at peace with one another. And I've always thought, well, that just felt like a left turn. Like, <laughs> hell, be salt, peace with one another. But then the more I meditated on it, the more, okay, that makes sense. Like, if, if we know we have eternal life in Jesus, like, and we are surrounded by people who are, who are on a road that leads to eternal hell, then, Let's, let's yeah be at peace with each other like don't fight with each other don't yeah, i mean yes have good, good discussions about disagreements but lift your eyes to what matters most that's and good. it's this gospel that we hold on to and and the world needs to hear it and three billion people in the world haven't even heard it and all kinds of people around us need it so so get your focus there and be salt be the kind of it's great. Uh, uh yeah savoring presence in people's lives around you that they'll want to hear that just like jesus tax collectors and sinners drawn to him it's be great. those kind of people in the way we honor and the way we love and we share good news that we know uh like stop fighting with each other like stop fighting together for the spread of the gospel to people around you. So anyway, it's, great. it's so good. I'm in. so glad you said that. I mean, I feel like we could talk for hours. Um, and for those listening, I hope that you're so encouraged. I'm so encouraged. I kept thinking of question after question, conversation after conversation. Those are the best kind of conversations mm. to get into in a podcast. You never know when you're starting a podcast where the conversation would go. You can have 10 questions for period and you go all 10. Or you can have 10 questions for period and you just go all over the place because that's where God's leading. And this was certainly one of those. I'm so thankful for that. Everybody, don't forget to go pick up his book, Don't Hold Back. It's coming out in, I think, two weeks from now. What's the release date? Yeah, February 28th. Yes. So you can pre-order it. Pre-order it now. Get it right when it comes out. If you like this conversation, there's a lot more where that came from. David, thanks again for being on the podcast. Every time um, Christian and I both talk to you or Heather, we uh, have a greater desire to know God. And those are the people that you mm-hmm. want to surround yourself with. So we're grateful for that. And uh, just so grateful for your family and your ministry. Well, that's 100% mutual. So, so great. And, and like you said, uh, praise God even for the way you lead a podcast like this and following the spirit's leadership. So yeah, just super thankful for you, Sadie and for Christian and your family and may God bless all the work of your hands. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.